good evening. Welcome to everybody to the Center for Architecture. Um, my name is Jill Lerner. I am the uh, New York chapter president for 2013, and uh, the AIA chapter is proud to host Design in the Heart of New York, the new heart of New York, presented by related companies and Oxford Properties Group here at the Center for Architecture's Breakthrough Space and Gallery. And you're here uh, in, in the Taffel Hall uh, Lecture Hall, and the gallery is upstairs. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Jay Cross, Dan Doktoroff, Mitchell Moss, Marianne Tai, and Jason Sheftel for the kickoff event of a fantastic eight-week speaker series. The installation and speaker series events will engage architects, designers, and civic leaders involved in the Hudson Yards project, sharing the development and architecture of Hudson Yards with the architectural community and the public for the very first time. Hudson Yards is pivotal for the future of New York, and the Center for Architecture is the perfect place to showcase this project and the work of many New York firms that will transform the west side of Manhattan. New Yorkers and visitors alike will have a chance to experience and to learn about this unprecedented project in a very hands-on way. Please pick up a postcard and mark your calendar. The postcards are at the front door and also in the exhibit. The next speaker series event is on May 16th with Bill Pedersen, and it will take place as a part of NYC by Design, a citywide city design festival which was just formally announced today in Times Square by Christine Quinn. The festival will take place from May 10th through the 21st, and the Center for Architecture will be hosting events each day, starting with Diller Scafidio and Renfro here on Friday, May 10th, followed by the Future of the City Symposium on Saturday, May 11th. We hope you will join us for a number of the exciting upcoming programs. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our Hudson Yards speaker series this evening with a panel on creating a 21st century neighborhood and introduce this evening's moderator, Jason Sheftel. Jason, uh, Jason Sheftel is the real estate editor at the New York Daily News. His groundbreaking neighborhood coverage has helped New Yorkers in all five boroughs understand their surroundings in a new light. Born in East New York, Sheftel lives in the West Village. He understands, like E.B. White, that New York is a series of very small towns in a very big city. It's people, their relationships, and what they contribute to the city that in what they contribute to the city they live in that makes New York the most wonderful place in the world. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and has lived in Paris and Hong Kong. He's happiest at any outdoor cafe in any city. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much. And New York is a, uh, a series of small villages, but I wouldn't call Hudson Yards small at all. Uh, we're going to start introducing the panelists. To my left, ladies first, Marianne Tai, who is the president of the Tri-State Region for New York City for CBRE. Mitchell Moss is the NYU professor, Henry Hart Rice Professor of Urban Policy and Planning at NYU, and just a kid from Forest Hills. Dan Doktoroff is the president and CEO of Bloomberg, was the former deputy mayor of New York City in charge of economic development, and before that was in charge of the committee to bring the Olympics to New York City for 2012, which is a good thing it didn't happen because we wouldn't be sitting here today. Well, we probably would. Be, we, we might be sitting here. I, 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 I want to and, and Dan also told me to be much more hard-hitting than I usually am because I'm for pro-development. I'm for this in the very – this is probably why they chose me. Uh, <laughs> Jay Cross is the president of Related Hudson Yards, and wherever he's gone in the past, somehow a stadium has gotten built. The Jets, the Miami Heat, and Toronto as well, I believe. Might still be one coming. Well, there could be. <laughs> so we're going to kick today off, actually, with Jay, who's going to try. Jay, tell us, define, what is Hudson Yards? What's it going to be by the numbers? What are we looking at here? Um, Hudson Yards, by the numbers, is 27 acres. Uh, in really two halves, the Eastern Yards and the Western Yards, bisected by 11th Avenue, 30th Street, which is the top end of the High Line, to 33rd Street, 10th Avenue to the river, uh, 13 million square feet, roughly 50-50 between commercial residential, which we think is an important attribute um, in terms of mixed use, approximately 500,000 square feet of retail, 14 buildings, um, let's see, about 10 or 11 acres of open public space, um, and then as a result of our uh, great transaction with the good people at Coach, uh, we've now determined, we define Hudson Yards as also including the block 
from 33rd to 34th, which is another million and a half square feet. And so it's growing. Five acres, and, and it's growing every day. Yeah. Dan, take us back to the beginning. Give us some chronology here, and I guess uh, you can be credited with coming up with the name. One of my proudest <laughs> achievements, actually. Yeah, no, um, so the actual Hudson Yard, you know, people have been talking about doing something with this area of Manhattan, which we always used to call the last frontier in Manhattan since the 1920s. In fact, one of the original ideas for it was to put Yankee Stadium on the Hudson Yards before Yankee Stadium was built in the Bronx. So people have been talking about this area literally for about 90 years before anything happened. Uh, as part of the Olympic plan, which was really a plan to really think about the neglected areas of the city, we focused on the rail yards, indeed the whole area between 42nd and 30th, between 9th and the river. And in 2005, just before the Olympic decision, had the entire area rezoned. Uh, the stadium part of it fell, so we had to go back on the western rail yards and come up with a new plan for the western rail yards. But the reality is it did all originate out of that Olympic bid. Marianne, tell us a little bit about what this is going to mean for New York City in terms of commercial office space and what tenants are going to, why this, why this is going to work. Uh, I think there are a number of reasons um, why Hudson Yards will work. First of all, it, it has the good fortune uh, to have caught the sort of uh, demand of the time. Right now, people want to work in a different way than they've worked in the past. They don't want to commute into a spot that's nowhere near residential, that's apart from you know, places they can buy their groceries. They, they want the work, live, play experience, and that's what Hudson Yards is creating. The other thing is um, that we've had a, a, a drought of new construction uh, in the city. I know nobody believes that because you see cranes everywhere, but they're really mostly, far and away mostly, residential. Um, we've built, um, since the year 2000, about 22.6 million square feet of office space, but we've withdrawn over 17 and a half million that have been converted to residential use. So in eras like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when we built on average about 55 million square feet of new construction of office space per decade, we now have something that's more in the neighborhood of 6 million in the last 13 years. So there's that. And let's face it, the buildings that do exist here in the city, about 74 years of age on average, um, really are of uh, a quality that without major retrofit or, you know, again, I c you can talk about how some of them are perfect for different uses, but for certain kinds of companies, and Coach is a classic example represented here by uh, the team that, uh, that made the deal and the architect right there as well. Um, it's a longer discussion, but it is indeed, uh, they have perfectly lovely buildings. Why would they go to new construction? That's part of the discussion. I mean, 74, an average years of 74 years for office buildings. That's ridiculous for a city of our size. So that quantifies how important this really is. Mitchell, tell us what this means for New York. Steve Ross, use that one. Steve Ross has said before that this is going to become the new heartbeat for New York City, or the new heart of New York. Mitchell, how big a project is this from a planning point of view, and, 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 and what's it mean? First, let me say, one, the movement to the west side of Manhattan was going on for 40 years. John Lindsay rezoned the western side of 6th Avenue. If you remember, Rockefeller said it didn't go to the west side. Then we saw uh, Mayor Koch, he rezoned and went west. We had a new rule, and many people here were responsible for the effort to put lights on office buildings, which was opposed by most developers at Times Square. Uh, Giuliani went to 8th Avenue, and then Dan Dockdorf did everything from 8th to the river, encompassing the entire area, creating basically a structure to finance the number seven extension, which is crucial to this. The center of gravity of Manhattan's office space has been moving west and south for 30 years, and this is really part of this process. One. Two, as Marianne said, we are changing who our workers are. Metro North has a declining ridership coming into Manhattan. Westchester County has a declining share of the Manhattan workforce. The average household doesn't consist of a breadwinner who comes to work and a housewife who raises the children. We have the households of America today are not anywhere defined by that kind of paradigm. And therefore, what Marianne said, people want to be closer to where they work. They want shorter commuting times for lots of different reasons. And that's why this corridor, and I argue it's everything from, you know, the 
area, which is Hudson Yards District, all the way south down to the World Financial Center. This is the energy corridor. We landmark the meat market, so it used to be the meat market, M-E-A-T, now it's the meat market, M-E-E-T, the pronunciation's the same, the meaning is different. And I think that this is going to continue on, and I think the difference in Hudson Yard, I just want to make one point, yeah. is if you go to the east side where we had the east side terminal, you have Solo's empty property, you have the former Con Ed plant, you have the complete mess from 3rd Avenue to the river, from 34th to the UN. That's what happens when you don't have any intelligent planning. And it looks that way. Uh, there's no neighborhood, there's an entrance to a tunnel, and the point is I think this provides a chance to kind of do something which is cohesive, coherent, and it's part of a natural force in which Manhattan's west and southern, th that side is blossoming and it's going to continue, and the number seven actually makes it connected to the rest of the city, something it lacked until now. Jay, how are you going to get this done? I mean, they tried to move Penn Station, I mean, Lindsay is the first of, I think, six mayors who sat at press conferences to, to move Penn Station. So from a journalist's point of view, I have to ask, how are you going to get this done? How are you going to execute? And how did this vision even happen in the first place? I hope we're not talking about Penn Station. No, we're not now. We're talking about Hudson Yards. <laughs> okay. But I don't want to be at seven press conferences. Um, <laughs> because I, I think uh, the trick for us and the trick for any developer on a scale of this tr uh, size is to mitigate risk. Uh, your ability to execute, I mean, a lot of the visionary work was done by the, the government ahead of us. So the, the master plan was pretty much set by the zoning, the planning department, the infrastructure investment. The city got ahead of the curve, and I think that's really important. And the fact that the city was able to do it at a single level of government was really important. Mm -hmm. So from the private sector point of view, it's not a complicated public-private partnership. It's actually a very straightforward public-private partnership. From our point of view, I think um, what tends to get developers in trouble is uh, we are hopeless optimist, if nothing else, and therefore we sometimes get way out over our skis in terms of battling all the cynics. And then when you get bigger and more complicated the project gets, the more cynics you have to combat. And the question becomes for us, how do we slice and dice risk? How do we mitigate it? How do we make sure that we build in a thoughtful way? How do we get critical mass? Um, so Canary Wharf for us is always an object lesson and sort of what not to do. Single use, got ahead of the public infrastructure, single source of financing, uh, all the things that we're not doing. Uh, and I think when you look at the success of Time Warner Center, um, when it was first announced, what I found most impressive about it is that the fact that Stephen Ross and related team had sliced and diced it in such a way that as complicated as it was, it all made sense as sort of separate parts and they all came together. And I think that for us is going to be the key. Lots of multi-use. Uh, what's good for the city is good for us. Um, good part working partnership with all the public authorities uh, and very diverse financing sources. Thanks. Programming. Tell, tell us a little bit about how you guys thought of the different mixes of how much residential versus how much commercial versus how much culture. Art plays a big part as, he, uh, as well here. I mean, this is going to be a, a public park on the waterfront, ferries coming in. How did you guys kind of resolve how much where? Well, we think that um, if you look on it, as I said earlier, think of it as two halves. When we bring the first half online, you really have to bring the whole thing online so that Tenants uh, don't want to move into a construction site for 10 or 15 years. They don't mind moving in for two or three years, right? But they want to know that it's kind of come to an end. Uh, and so, so the idea is that we're going to build the eastern yard in one fell swoop. And that means, when you think about it, 6 million square feet. Wow, that's a lot. Well, yeah, but there's 4 million square feet of office space. So if we do two or three big deals, uh, then you've got the office space off and running. We know that uh, retail demand on the west side is unbelievable. Uh, so generally speaking, in America today, there's 25 to 30 square feet of retail per person. And you all know there's lots of malls with a lot of for rent signs. In Manhattan, it's only 10 square feet per person. On the west side, from Columbus Circle to Tribeca, 8th Avenue to the river, it's only five square feet per person. And in that same area, you have 400,000 people living who are extremely affluent. And, and single and shop and dine out all the time. And it's very, as much as we think that the meatpacking district is fantastic, we're nowhere close to satisfying the demand. And we find that now from the retailers. So that, that's a big shift in the way in which retailers think of New York. They used to think they had to be, a, they could only be on Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue. But if you go to Paris and London, you'll see there's Prada stores everywhere. There's LVMH stores everywhere. And they've now come to realize it's true of Manhattan as well. They need to be in multiple locations. And in particular, they need to be in the West Side. And they need to have critical mass. 
so they can't go and you know they can't all fit in the packing district even if they wanted to go there so for us the retail is huge demand five hundred thousand feet it propels office users it makes people want to live there and then the residential you do because there's always an insatiable demand for residential and the question simply is how much can you bring online in any given year and right now in that part of town wow so we've got 300,000 300 units coming online in our project on 30th street right now got another hundred so on 29th street avalon's building about 2,000 we'll bring on at least a thousand twelve hundred units on the eastern rail yards and then we haven't even got to the western yard routes which is 80 percent residential so it's we're going to be bringing that on as fast as the market can absorb it that's going to be an interesting test as to how fast can the market absorb it dan you run one of the biggest media companies in the world right now. How is the world changing? How are consumers changing? How do we want to work in the future? How fast are companies growing? What, what makes or doesn't make this project right for this time from the point of view of shifts in what people want? Well, there's a couple things. The first is is that the way in which people do want to work is changing. You know, if you come to Bloomberg, you know, we're we're headquartered uh, just south of uh, Bloomingdale's. Um, none of the 15,000 people who work at Bloomberg actually have an office. Um, we absorb roughly 100 square feet per person versus a typical company or law firm of 200 to 250, maybe even 300 square feet. It's completely open. Uh, and people want that today. And they're recognizing that pulling people out of offices and putting them into a new environment, which is really hard in a traditional office building, particularly one that on average is 74 years old, is not the culture that they want to create. I've had CEOs of companies who are actually interested in looking at very interesting in Hudson Yards come to Bloomberg where I've given them a tour to show them kind of how culture and design can interact with each other to produce a completely different experience. You don't get a commission for that, do you? I mean, and we're working. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a different world where people are working differently, even in big companies. Even law firms are beginning to understand that. Uh, we brought in about 30 lawyers from our law firm in-house. Of course, they now sit at six foot, five and a half foot desks. Everybody said, that's going to be impossible. How are they going to deal with privacy? How are they going to deal with um, the issues of concentration? They've all adapted. And that's the wave of the future. So old office buildings, it's really hard to accommodate. And the global shift, the national shift, is the technological companies, what kind of... It's, it's not a global shift. It's a U.S. shift that is being led by technology companies that is then being adopted by increasingly the people that they deal with. If you go to Europe, maybe London's occasionally here, they're an exception, or go to Asia, no one is adopting that yet. America is at the forefront. Well, I'm going to go one step further then. Does that mean... We're becoming a more transparent culture. What's that mean for the U.S. as a, as a nation, um, as we advance, as we try to advance? How are we, are we going to become more open, more, more are we going to like each other more? Have, are we going to be, is it going to be easy for us to be around each other? We're talking about a shift in how we look at our peers. Look, it's happening slowly, um, and this is a work experience. I'm not sure it, it uh, transfers to anything else. Look, we did it in government, you know, for... 11 and a half years now in City Hall, all of the mayor's top aides sat in the same room, this small room. Um, out of that, it's an interesting study in psychology, Bloomberg administration has not had a leak in 11 and a half years out of that bullpen. Why? Because when people feel like they have access to information, even if they really don't, they don't feel the need to parade their being on the inside. It's a fascinating phenomenon. And the reality is having the decision maker, decision makers where you can just walk up, tap them on the shoulder and say, what do you think about this? Or can I get a decision on this? And it happens instantly. It's just a complete revolution in the way people work. I, I think it is the wave of the future. Uh, and as I said, you know, companies who are doing quite well typically tend to be on the cusp of that wave. Not one leak. I think that means I'm not doing my job. Probably true. <laughs> I hope. I'm, so, I, I'm not going to comment, that. No, not gonna comment on that. I've interviewed him a few times before, but that's... Marianne, based on what Dan has said, are, 
is this what companies, when they, when they come through you, your door, are they asking for this? Do they want this? And how has that changed the way you sell and the way you talk to building owners who have to really, sh they have to make changes in order to comply with some of, of what companies want today? What are you seeing on this level? And can we fill all this space in Hudson Yards? Um, I, I think the first thing is that the buzzword of the moment, you know how there are these, these words that sort of take on, is density. When you talk to anyone who's beginning to design a new headquarters or an office for themselves, they're talking about basically the density and what people don't realize at the moment that you open up the space and go to, I mean, I'm shocked at 100. I, I haven't done anybody with less than 175 square feet per person. Obviously, that cl includes all the amenity space and the common area, et cetera. But what they forget is that the building infrastructure has to support this. I have a, com a customer right now. Uh, who shall remain nameless, who is looking to relocate. And I can tell you that um, people queue up for the elevators in this building, a perfectly decent midtown building where there actually is a wait. They queue up at the ladies' room. At the moment you begin to pack people onto floors in a denser way, everything needs to support that. It's very hard to do with older buildings. Uh, in terms of filling up Hudson Yards, uh, let me say uh, uh, something. I'm not, not sure Jay is going to like what I'm about to say. Um, you know, it's cheaper to go there um, than it is to go to a major midtown building. Um, and we're talking about new construction. Before, um, in preparation for today, I looked at the top 50 buildings in Manhattan. And I asked this, first of all, I asked, how old are they? On average, they're 33 years old. So right off, you're talking about a younger crop of buildings. The average rent in Midtown today across all A and B properties, whatever, is just under $70. The average rent on those top 50 buildings is $98 per square foot and change. Now, I'm sitting here telling you that Jay will do a much better deal than that. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay? And I, 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 I want you to understand that it's because there was an, an intelligent um, uh, tax program, and we can have a whole conversation about real estate taxes, but an intelligent tax program that the Yards has that doesn't exist elsewhere. Uh, and I can also tell you that one of the advantages of the, of the scheme with the balance between residential and retail and commercial is that it doesn't put all the pressure on the commercial to make that the profit center. We all know in Manhattan, if you build housing, they will come. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the under-retailed area of the yards, also they will come. So there isn't this need to make it all in the office buildings. And as a consequence of all of those factors, Hudson Yard is going to fill up. Mitchell, you love New York City. I know you do. How is this going to help us stay globally competitive? And where are we now in the global mindset of people who want to come to New York and why? You know, the past decade, we've had three great disasters. We had the attack of September 11th. We had the 2008 financial collapse. Places like Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns are now historic names. Then we had Sandy. And everyone said each time New York is going to never recover, we're going to have people leave. Just the opposite is true. In fact, you know, we have gone from having, in Manhattan County, I mean, New York County alone has gone from having 5.4% of the nation's deposits to 7.2%. Because the collapse of those banks, you know, that's why Charlotte, North Carolina is a, a one bank city. And we've seen, you know, there isn't, you know, a Wachovia anymore as part of Wells Fargo. And, and New York has actually done very well over the past decade, better than anyone expected in part because we haven't recovered, we've transformed the city. There's a myth that we've recovered. No, this is a different place today than it was 12 years ago. The flower district doesn't exist, the garment district doesn't exist, the financial district doesn't exist. We have new places. We actually create places. Other cities work so hard, you know, I'm not going to make any comments about other locations, but, you know, we have changed what goes on in Manhattan in such a profound way that we now take it for granted. You know, the, the Martinique Hotel was the worst welfare hotel in New York City during the Koch administration. You know, the 11th Commandment, you can't say a bad word about the Koch administration. It was a disaster. Now, everyone who's been around Broadway from 32nd to 28th, that's the hottest part of town. You can't get a, a coffee in some parts of the, the hotels here. And I think to understand Hudson New York, you have to understand that this is the natural extension of what is really you know, the movement of activities. And they're not just office activities, it's culture, it's nightlife. You know, Manhattan isn't just a place to work. People come here to do lots of things. And I think that's, you know, in my view, the, the, you know, the culture shed, 
It's about 200 square feet, 200,000 square feet. You know, that's part of the benefit there, that they're going to build in activities that are not just work, because people are really not going to an office building. Let me make one comment. Who ever thought that Bryant Park would be the name of three office buildings? But now it is. I mean, who ever thought that Times Square would have its name on three office buildings? So the tenant no longer puts its name on the building. It's the location that defines the building. And that's why Hudson Square is just a natural kind of evolution. Hudson Yards is the natural evolution of this. As a planner, you have to look at all five boroughs. You have to look at the, even into the, into the stratosphere. You, know, you look at Long Island City. You look at parts of Brooklyn. You take the extension of the 7 train, for example. I mean, people that live in Long Island City are going to get on that 7 train. If they work at Hudson Yards, they're going to live along that corridor. Whatever it is to get them to work likely. They want to get to work as easy as possible. Give us an idea of what kind of ripple Hudson Yards is going to have in terms of impact on other more fringe or marginal neighborhoods outside of Manhattan. The, the power of Manhattan is now creating an east-west energy core. It's no longer to the north. That's why Hoboken and Jersey City are booming. The, they and the interior parts of the East River are now the fastest growing parts of the Manhattan workforce. You know, John Lindsay and Rockefeller built these awful developments, Starrett City, Co-op City, 30 miles away, and I think you have to say that Bloomberg and Dr. took the East River. People, most politicians were afraid to rezone industrial property. They let it lay fallow. So now we're changing the ecological pattern of development, and it's east and west. It's both on the other side of the Hudson. And by the way, we're going to see more ferries coming into Hudson Yards. We're going to have many more flexible ways of getting there because ever since, you know, there is not that much capacity. Remember, Manhattan has 20 bridges and tunnels, three cross the Hudson, the rest cross into the other boroughs. There's something wrong here. Governor Christie didn't make it better. <laughs> Jay, take us through when the project will be completed and try to help us understand what it's going to feel like and be like on the ground. If I work for Coach, in four years and live in Chelsea. What's my, well, how is this going to change my life from a very layman on the ground perspective of what it's going to feel like to be there? <clears throat> well, the timeline is that the, uh, the South Tower, which is the home for Coach, L'Oreal, and SAP, will be finished in mid-15. That's the first building. Uh, then we are going to start the, the platform over the rail yards uh, January 14. Uh, and that is being driven by the schedule for the retail complex, which we want to have open in the fall of 17. And our expectation is that between starting the deck in 14 and completing the retail in 17, we will secure an anchor tenant for the North Tower, which is the big one, 2.3 million square feet. That would then open in uh, 18 slash 19 for tenants to occupy. And then along the way, around 17, will be the two residential towers. So. The entire Eastern Yards is designed to be finished by, let's say, first quarter of 19. Um, now, that's ambitious. Uh, so in terms of the public space, uh, what's it going to feel like? I mean, I wish I could give you a really good answer. Um, we are com heavily committed to a really groundbreaking art program. Do you have an artist yet? We do not have an artist yet. You can't leak that information we're, to me. We're, we're committed to an exploration of all, we're, uh, all the best sculptors in the world. Um, we hope to have someone on board by the summer. We're working with a very talented young landscape architect, and Thomas Waltz. Um, and so we hope to, so we'll be finalizing the, um, the sort of open place plan by the end of the year. But, you know, it's, it's uh, what's really difficult, I think, um, uh, Marianne's brother, Tom Scarangelo, was back there, introduced me to an engineer once, uh, Olaf Sut, who uh, is very good on moving parts. And I was describing how we'd come up with this great scheme uh, to move the stadium, actually. And uh, he said, well, do you have this and you have that? No, no, would you take this kind of like this? I said, oh, so in other words, uh, everything works until you draw it to scale. Mm -hmm. And it's such a great line, you know. And for an architectural crowd, I would encourage you to take it to heart. But, you know, everything works until you draw it to scale. So when we draw this neighborhood to scale, we don't really have many comparables. It's very difficult. We know what's really important is from 100 feet down to the ground, it has to be authentic, it has to feel right, it has to be comfortable. People have to feel like they can do a whole different range of activities. Um, but when we look around the world and we look for spaces from which we can learn, we come up with a very short list. And usually that list is you know, two or 300 years old and it's somewhere in Italy. And so... Uh, <laughs> Piazza. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. And the success of the High Line sort of actually confounds you a little bit. You know, it's not spacious, but it's usually crowded and popular. And so we really go back and forth. Um, but I think what's going to be interesting about the open space, 
as it affects people's perception is, uh, and Bill Pedersen made this point, when you look at the skyline shots, and I encourage you in the exhibit upstairs, if you look at the skyline shots, because of the five acres of open space, basically in the middle of the eastern yards, it's like there's a hole in the skyline. You know, we're not used to that in New York. Everything's supposed to be, you know, block to block, grid line to grid line. And this spaciousness is going to feel completely different. Uh, and I like to be able to say it's going to feel absolutely fantastic, but I have to say it's early days yet, and it's, um, it's going to be one of our most challenging aspects. They are smiling in those renderings, most of the people. <laughs> and it's always sunny as well. <laughs> but let, 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 sunny. Me, let me actually make a point, because the one thing that people sometimes forget to do is put Hudson Yards, the related part of Hudson Yards, in context. You have to remember that you know, it is essentially halfway in between Times Square and the Meatpacking District, with the High Line essentially connecting it from the south. And the High Line, of course, has exceeded everybody's expectations. I think 4.4 million people walked on the High Line last year. So what you've got is you've got West Chelsea pushing to the north. So the Hudson Yards actually is going to bleed into West Chelsea and the growth that you're seeing there. And from the north, there's actually going to be a park that you're going to be able to walk through all the way down into Hudson Yards from Times Square. So it's going to have this bleeding, in a way, almost of low culture from the north, high culture with the Whitney anchoring at the south. And it's going to be, we think, sort of the knuckle of sort of the west side of Manhattan with all of this activity, said cultural, retail, residential, and office kind of all emptying into this place. It, it, I think it's going to be spectacular. I like the use of we there. Are you taking out space maybe as well? You guys growing? Uh, all right, <laughs> no, but I, want to, I want to stay with Dan for a second here because something we haven't talked about at length is the private-public collaboration here and how cities have to come together to get something like this done working with a developer who can get this done. From the very beginning, I mean, all of the many facets of government, as well as creative ideas that change the way we in cities grow, using taxes to pay for extended transportation, using high line air rights to sell off to developers. I mean, the, the Bloomberg administration has done things that no other government in the world has done by creating money out of nothing in, in some ways. So tell me a little bit about the, how that works and, and what it means uh, that we're at this point right now. Well, look, you know, we, as Jay said earlier, we always believe that the key to this entire area was connecting the city's mass transit system to it, and that meant extending the number seven line. Now, we also knew that there was no way we were ever going to get the money from the MTA <laughs> in order to be able to build the number seven line. Uh, you know, there were other priorities, uh, Second Avenue subway, east side access, that basically absorbed every dollar of expansion capacity for the next 50 years. And so we knew we had to come up with a different way of doing it. And so the city ended up paying um, for the number seven line. Now, how do you commit to do that at a time, got to remember, early in the Bloomberg administration, we were facing a fiscal crisis. We essentially raised money on the promise that there actually would be development in Hudson Yards. That had never been done before um, in New York. And you know, I said the development still has to occur. You're seeing residential development all over the entire area. But you got to be creative. You also have to ground your planning in sound economic and financial analysis. And I think that's one of the things that Mike Bloomberg and the Bloomberg administration has actually brought that's pretty unique, that sometimes gets lost in the day-to-day -day politics of things, is that we looked at it like a business. You know, what really are developers going to be able to rent this stuff for? How do they think about it? And we reached out to literally dozens and dozens of developers. We did detailed financial analyses of the entire area and convinced ourselves that it was a project that could actually work. You know, one of the things that you think about sort of the next four years and the four years after that, you got to think of government, you got to think of a city as being in a competitive world with real financial dynamics that drive people's decisions to, to do things. And without that, you're going to make really terrible mistakes. So will we ever see your name on that mayoral ballot? No. <laughs> Mitchell wants to comment a little bit on this. And Mitchell, while you're talking, 
you know, it seems to me that New York City is becoming a series of skylines. I mean, you have places like Flushing, Jamaica, uh, Long Island City, downtown Brooklyn. You're going to have Willits Point. You now have Hudson Yards. And you have Financial District. We're becoming uh, this wonderful view from the sky of not just one continuous skyline, but a series of different skylines. Comment on what you want to comment on, and then talk to us about how that impacts the city. I, I want to go back to your first question. I think what the Hudson Yards reflects is a change in the way the city approaches land. I think Dan alluded to this. Up until the past decade, a private developer owned a piece of property, went to city planning, and asked to have it rezoned if they didn't want to go as of right. As of right allows them to build as much as they can within this limited frame of the density and the height, as many people here know. And what happened over the past decade is the city took the initiative and said, we're going to rezone vast portions of the city, whether it's on the East River, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, whether it's on uh, Flatbush Avenue, and certainly on the west side of Manhattan, which you've heard about. This has really done two things. One, it put lawyers out of business. You know, it, it no, hasn't, they, no, now you have to be much more skilled to work within this. But it changed the way development occurred. The city basically created the conditions for five private developers to then take advantage of the zoning. Let's remember, Jerry Spire walked away from this. Check it out. The point is that the underlying... It's very quotable. Yeah. <laughs> the underlying change is that we basically created opportunities for the private sector then to do things. And this one required much more than just the rezoning. It required the number seven. And I think we should be very thankful that the state has kind of taken a passive role here. The last thing you'd want is to have to go through the US federal rules and environmental guidelines to build any mass transit system. And in many ways, the city bypassed the most bureaucratic operation of all, which is the United States Department of Transportation. And doing that, that's the reason I think the number seven is we built on time. Remember, this has allowed us to kind of accelerate the development by doing it without going to Washington, DC. I mean, this really is a mini city, Marianne, in a lot of ways. Um, when we hear the word mixed use being bantered around all the time, do commercial tenants want that? Do they want to be a part of something so strong in mixed use and, and part of new, vibrant, mini cities to a certain extent? And how does that play into their decision? You know, unless you, um, you would be in a suburban office park if you didn't want mixed use. The people who come to our city want all of these things mixed up. They want brand new, great towers, but they also want warehouses. One, one, part of the magic of, of Hudson Yards, and I think one of the things that it's been lucky, and you'll forgive me because there's been great planning, great insight and vision, but you also have to have moments of luck. The High Line, nobody. I can tell you, I think for Coach, the High Line was the, th the tipping point, even though Coach had been in the neighborhood for decades. It was the idea of being at the head of the High Line and looking down that really was transformative. Hudson River Park. The fact also that it is a, a combination of um, high, you know, these enormous towers and low density too. It's all of those rhythms combined with all that we've talked about. People come to New York for that diversity. It's the diversity of the population written onto the cityscape, if you will. And I think Hudson Yard sort of checks all those boxes. It's, it, it will be interesting over time to watch, it, to watch it define itself, because I don't think anybody would have bet that the first tenants would come from the um, uh, design and fashion and uh, cosmetic world and technology. No one designed Hudson Yards with those tenants in mind. And you're going to, uh, I know, Mitchell, here. No, uh, 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 let me say this. Uh, have you, poor, poor Marianne, no. have you go to the first floor of Bloomingdale's or Saks? It's all cosmetics. But, but no one <laughs> thinks of them as being pioneers of commercial real estate. Okay, Back in the I, 70s, I, I, it was the best pickup scene in New York, from what I understand. Right, right, right. Sure right. Okay. Um, we, did a, we, did a, we did a study on um, people's favorite neighborhoods in New York. And we divided the study into three classes of people. Uh, office workers, residents, and tourists slash shoppers. And we asked them, what are their favorite neighborhoods in New York? What are the attributes of their favorite neighborhoods in New York, both emotional and physical? And what we found, which was astonishing to us, is that for an office worker, their favorite neighborhood in New York is not Park Avenue or Avenue of the Americas. For an office worker, their favorite neighborhood is Union Square, Madison Square. For a resident, Union Square, Madison Square, and the West Village. For a shopper, Union Square, Madison Square, and Times Square. And so what we found is that, and then when you talk about the attributes, it's about liveliness. 
the fact that it's 24-7. So again, I would, you know, anyone who's been around Time Warner Center on a Sunday or been around Time Warner Center at 10 o'clock at night or being around Time Warner Center when it's stultifyingly hot outside, it's an active, vibrant place. So then we start talking to these big CEOs, and it's very interesting, particularly in the creative class industries, but it's equally true in the financial services. They are competing for workers. They're competing to recruit workers, and they're competing to retain workers. And therefore, much more than ever before, the quality of the workspace is important to them because they're in a competitive environment where they've got to have the best knowledge worker they can find. And New York, more than any other city in the country now, is the home of the knowledge worker. And it's exemplified by the fact that our economy is very diverse. It's not just financial services. If you're thinking about the creative class, they're here. Uh, they may be working in fashion or publishing or cosmetics or, or, or performing arts, but definitely the most creative people in America come to New York City. And they all have to have a place to live and work and dine. And so that's what's driving these new neighborhoods, that the old neighborhoods cannot serve up this kind of, unless by happenstance. And in which case, if it is by happenstance, they're low density. And so they can't quite compete with the demands of today in terms of scale, drawing it to One scale. Let, let me build this. Manhattan has more college graduates than any other island in North America. There are neighborhoods where 80% of the people over 25 are college graduates, especially on the west side, especially down in Tribeca, Soho. So it's the level of education on this island and the level of education in the close in areas is now growing and that's part of the workforce. Most employers realize the key thing is getting, as you said, the workers. It used to be that the Grand Central area was the magnet because they were coming from Westchester. They're not coming from there anymore. There's a different residential pattern. That's changing the work pattern. And I think what we don't appreciate is that this is now at a point where, you know, the east-west access is spreading deeper into Queens and Brooklyn. It's going way beyond just the border area. And that, of course, gives a gateway effect coming into the western part of Manhattan. Fantastic. We're going to open it up for questions now. Uh, who wants to go first? Sir. Mike's coming right now. Wait, one moment, sir. It's right there. Yep, you got it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think there's no question, uh, whether you are a fan or not, uh, that Mayor Bloomberg has really transformed a lot about the way development happens in New York City. What are the challenges of a post-Bloomberg New York in building Hudson's, Hudson Yards, and not just the Hudson Yards that related his building, but the entire uh, area? I guess I'll take that. I mean, one of the reasons you actually do all this planning, rezoning, infrastructure investment is so subsequent administrations can't screw it up. <laughs> uh, and, you know, no, uh, seriously, I mean, I think what Jay said earlier is it's the job of government to create the conditions so that the private market can flourish. And whether that is uh, infrastructure or whether that's rezoning, whether it's creating parks, um, what we've always tried to do, um, at least in the Bloomberg administration, is create those conditions. It's once something is in place, it's really hard to change it, particularly when everyone has an as of right ability to get something done. So, you know, it's nailing things down. I, I think in something like Hudson Yards, you know, assuming they get all their agreements done, um, you know, with the MTA. Done. It's done. Then there's there's very little that can be done to mess it up. Great. Someone else, please. Hands, sir. For those who know me from coming to these uh, functions, I tend to be the a kind of an antagonist because I'm looking for the soft spots. Uh, this one's tough because you guys are doing a great job, and I think it's uh, usually my theme is complexity, but I see over the overall plan there is a lot of complexity, and I'm glad to see that. Now, my other agenda has to do with a much bigger picture than the city, and it has to do with climate change and energy, and we have a, a mark up here of 14 and a half feet, and so I wonder, uh, we've never touched on that in any of your uh, questions, and I did a little bit of research before I came in, and I looked at the towers, and I see towers that, you know, the skin on the north is the same as the skin on the south, there's no response to wind, and, and microclimates, I, as far as I can understand. So would someone pick up on, on how we're dealing with that number up there at the top? Jay, Jay can do that after I just take the first part of it. One of the reasons those things aren't addressed anymore is because 
the architects and the developers, the good ones, are addressing them well before we even get near the need to discuss them. The best builders today and the best architects today, who are all part of this actually, are green builders. And without doing that, they can't even be in the profession anymore, or they can't even build it anymore. So Jake, you can tell us what exactly this has to do with it, but that's, those things aren't needed to be addressed as much because they are such ingrained into the body of the structure to begin with. But they should be. Um, well, I'll deal with the, maybe your hardest one first, which is the microclimate and wind. And there's no question in big, tall buildings, we, we do a huge amount of wind studies and we try our best to create a, um, a pleasing climate at grade. But even where you got short buildings, when it's blowing really hard out of the northwest, it's blowing really hard out of the northwest. And it's, uh, there's, a, there's a limit, I think, to what can be done on that level. But I think with the broader question you raise, um, even pre-Sandy, we were extremely focused on resiliency. We have cogeneration on site. Um, you know, we think it's actually, uh, while it's a complication, it's a blessing. Our ground floor is 40 feet above sea level, so uh, forget Sandy. Even a 100 or 200 year flood is not going to get to our ground floor. But uh, we went back post-Sandy and looked at all of our elevator pits, so they're all sealed. If you guys, it's not for us. It's not good enough to say. Oh yeah, the elevator's down because the very, very bottom basement flooded, but don't worry, it'll be up running tomorrow. It has to be running throughout the entire storm. Uh, so, and we found, again, I, I, I keep going back to Time Warner Center, but it's so illustrative. During Sandy, it was a place of refuge. I mean, that Equinox was running 24-7 just with people taking showers. And so uh, that's, and the Mandarin Hotel, same thing, feeding meals. So we think Everything about Hudson Yards has been designed uh, for a Category 1 hurricane, which is you know, bigger than Sandy. We're, uh, we're working a lot with Mark Rick's group at the city in terms of you know, what have we learned from it, what can we do better. Silly things like cogen, okay? So Con Ed, if you put cogen in that provides for more than 15% of your building's power, Con Ed charges you a higher rate. Well, that just discourages from putting cogen in. And why wouldn't we want cogen when we have a sandy event in the city? We, you know, natural gas is flowing freely, and we want people to be able to generate their own power. So sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot. Um, glass, uh, Marianne made the point earlier about the modern workplace. If you're going to densify, it has to be open to natural light. And so floor-to-ceiling glass is here to stay when it comes to office environments, and you'll see that all throughout Europe. Um, but having said that, the glass performance is super high performance. Uh, the air, we're beating ASHRAE standards by a mile. Um, for us, uh, gold is a given, and we actually are aiming to platinum as much as possible. It just means uh, more bike racks and showers for cyclists, I think, is what it comes down to. And that's, that's the other point. Sometimes the LEED standard is not really the standard by which we should be measuring that's a whole other panel. and sustainability. That's, another, that's a, another talk for another day. Right. Any more questions, please? Ma'am? I'll have one more after this. Joanna, is that right? So what was your uh, interaction with the community? And give us some good examples of changes you made your, to your plan in response to the community input. Well, do you want to talk about well, the, the Going back originally in the planning for this as opposed to in the execution, um, no, the, the interaction with the community was intense. I mean, this process went on for about three years. Um, to get the plan done. And in fairness, I think as a result of that process, both the community, the borough president, ultimately the city council, um, it became a better plan. I, I'd say the single biggest change um, to the plan actually was to provide more affordable housing, not just on the yards, but in the entire surrounding area. So. I believe the numbers were all together. Um, over time, will be developed roughly 13,000 units of housing in the entire area, again, 42nd to 30th, 9th to 12th. And of that, almost 30% will be subsidized in some form or other. Uh, there's a lot more provision of public space, uh, additions of schools, both in the Hudson Yards and just outside of it. Uh, so again, community input. Uh, is incredibly important. I became a huge believer, actually, in the Euler process uh, over the course of my time in City Hall, where I think invariably that dialogue between the community um, and the city, as well as developers, if relevant, always made the result better. Thank you. One more. 
I'll grab the last one then. I don't, I don't see any hands. How is this going to impact, Mitchell, the rest of the city? Javits, the garden. Uh, you've got some real serious questions over there that need to be answered. The post office, the a new train station. What, what, how is what Hudson Yards going to impact that whole neck of, as you call, the Hudson Yards district? Because those, it's not going to look the same in, in 15 years, not just because of Hudson Yards. Other variables will be missing. You know, almost every big project has unanticipated effects. Look at Battery Park City. No one really expected it. It was originally going to be only residents, then it had commercial. I think we, you know, we have no idea when you put 13 million square feet in a place, how that affects. I mean, I think it's going to become a huge retailing mecca. You know, I think Macy's will suffer. Well, my real point, I think yeah. that there are a lot of areas on, you know, the Midtown 34th Street Carter is going to have to do, they have to invest and upgrade to be competitive. My view is I think the, the obviously, you know, Penn Station is such a hot topic now. You know, I'm not going to dare touch that with experts in this room. But I would say that, you know, what's interesting here is it's not just the immediate area. I think it changes the entire relationship to New Jersey. It changes the relationship to Queens and Brooklyn because this is going to be a destination for work, hopefully for culture. And I think that, that's what makes Manhattan. I think Marianne talked about the fact that the lots of choices when you different exciting areas. Well, you know, what's amazing is we're just creating another destination for people to experience and enjoy. And most cities barely have one small area. We have multiple ones, and we create more of them. I think that's going to be part of the magic of the city of New York, which will continue to be a place. Not everybody wants to be in high density, but if you want to be in high density areas with lots of choices, in North America, there's only one place. It's New York City now. Remember, San Francisco is 800,000 people, 10% the size of Manhattan, of New York City. It's one-tenth of New York City. It's not even a comparison in terms of its kind of role in the world economy. By the way, I was just going to say on Javits, you didn't address Javits. <laughs> I think it's going to create a lot of pressure on Javits, which is this hulking building in the middle of what's going to be a vibrant neighborhood. My own view is Javits actually ought to move to Long Island I City. I agree. <laughs> Cheers to that. Thank you all for coming. This has been really interesting for me. Thank you. <laughs>